Yeah, we're gonna do a little, little uh, review of some BC topics. This is BC number one. This is a, like a mostly multiple trucks packet. We're gonna take some notes. So you're going to follow along with me. I'm gonna have you guys try some problems. We'll try some together. And then you'll finish whatever we don't finish on your own. So uh, first of all, parametrics is two dimensional motion, right? 2D motion. So we're taking it up a uh, dimension from last year's rectilinear motion or calc AB. The idea is you can think of this as like a, a vector. Some of you guys have taken physics, so this makes a more sense, but this is showing the, the direction and the size of the velocity. And so the length of this line is actually the size and the direction tells you direction. And we can break it down into there's a velocity in the X direction and a velocity in the y direction, v sub x, v sub y. From that, we can get a lot of different things. Um, first of all, the position vector is x, y. The velocity vector is uh, v, x, v, y. So often we describe these things as two separate values or relationships for each direction. They like to use these symbols for the velocity and acceleration. Um, I don't think it'll matter if you just put regular parentheses, though. Um, they just seem to usually do this on the college board. Uh, we could also write that as dx dt, dy dt, so the derivative of the x position with respect to time, the derivative of the y position, position with respect to time, the second derivative of x with respect to t, the second derivative of y with respect to t time. So those are some things that sometimes you're asked to give. Speed is the, is the magnitude of velocity. And so it's like the length of that line, we don't care about direction. We just care about, well, what's the overall speed? Now, speed is the absolute value of velocity, which would be like just the length of that line without any concern with for signs. And that's an, you know, an easy relationship to create is uh, Pythagorean theorem, Vx squared plus Vy squared equals V squared. And so from that, we would take the square root of V sub X squared plus V sub Y squared or you could write it in terms of other ways of describing the velocity, dx dt squared, dy dt squared. Now these are not second derivatives. These are the first derivative squared. Um, and so that's speed. Um, it's just really a Pythagorean theorem idea. Distance, arc length. So since last year, we said that uh, Distance is the integral of speed, and speed is the absolute value of velocity. And last year, we would have to integrate the absolute value of velocity but one dimension. Now for us, we just got done writing down what speed is, so that's what you're gonna put in here. It's gonna be the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. So it's gonna have t's in it, all inside the square root, dt. Um, of course, you could write it other ways. v sub x squared, v sub y squared, dt. But it's just the integral of speed, same idea as last year. Speed's a little different, but speed's really just simple use of uh, Pythagorean theorem. So why don't you guys go ahead and try problems one, two, three, and four. And so what I'd like you to do right now is to just go ahead and pause the video and try those on your own. And then after you've tried one, two, three, and four, um, then you can unpause the video and I'll show you how to do them. And you can just check your answers, make sure you know how to do them. And then we'll go to the next page and do some more notes. All right, so go for it, go ahead and try it. 
So a particle moves in the xy plane so that at time t its x coordinates are. So this is x coordinate and y coordinate. At time one, what's the acceleration vector? Well, acceleration is the second derivative of position. So we need uh, x prime, which is 2t, and x double prime, which is 2. We need y prime, which is negative 3t squared, and y double prime is negative 6t. And so at time one, the answer is, well, when you plug one into the second derivative of x, it's two all the time, and then this one's gonna be negative six, and so that's your answer. Now, like I said, they use they like to use these symbols, but you sometimes you'll encounter parentheses, and I think if you wrote parentheses on your AP test, that would be fine. Number two, particle moves in the xy plane, so that at any time t, t is greater than zero, so we generally, only deal with positive time on motion problems, same deal as last year. It's x coordinates are, so they're giving you x, y coordinate equations. At t equals five, the velocity vector is. Now vectors, like I said, generally in parametrics, you're gonna describe acceleration with two separate components, x first, y second. Velocity, same thing. Position, same thing. So we need to find the derivative. Um, it's going to be a product rule. E to the t times derivative of sine is cosine t plus sine t times derivative of e to the t is e to the t. And then we could plug pi into this, and we would get e to the pi cosine of pi plus e to the pi sine of pi. And sine of pi is 0. Cosine of pi is negative 1. So it's going to be negative e to the x. That's the first part. And then y prime is going to be e to the t times the derivative of cosine is negative sine t plus cosine t times the derivative of e to the t is e to the t. And we're going to get uh, negative uh, e. So now we can just go ahead and start plugging pi in. So you plug pi in, you get a negative e to the pi sine pi plus e to the pi cosine pi. Sine pi is zero, cosine pi is negative one. And so y prime pi is negative e to the pi. So your velocity vector at pi is x first, negative e to the pi, y second, negative e to the pi. And that's your answer. And so we're looking for negative e to the pi, negative e to the pi. All right, so quick and easy. Sometimes they give you something that easy on, even for your response, um, but they can show up on multiple choice also. Okay, number three, a particle moves x, y plane. So that's velocity vector is this. So this is v sub x, v sub y. So they give me velocity vector. The particle's position times zero is, so this is x zero and this is y zero. This is an initial condition, position. What's the position vector at time three? So that means we need to find x three and y three and we're we're going to need to find them separately. So it's going to be kind of the same kind of work, but twice. Um, this is a great problem. Uh, if you have a graphing calculator to use fundamental theorem of calculus part one. Um, so you could, there's, there's two ways you could do this. You could say, okay, well, X T is going to be the integral of velocity X DT. And that's going to be the integral of t squared dt. So that's going to be uh, t cubed over 3 plus c. And then you can use your initial condition. Now, we're just using that one. We're going to say that x0 is 1 when time is 0. And so c equals 1. And so then xt equals t cubed over three plus one, and then we can plug any time we want into it. And we get a 27 over three plus one equals nine plus one is 10. And so that's half your answer. Now with that, we could eliminate C and A if we feel confident, it's gotta be B, D, or E. And then you're gonna do the same thing for Y, or 
instead of doing that, you could use fundamental theorem of calculus part one, which if you had a calculator, you really would want to do. And if you couldn't integrate these by hand, you'd really want to do it. And, you know, even if you're doing it by hand without a calculator, you might choose to do it this way. But um, this is where I'd say, okay, well, if I integrate the derivative of something, um, I'm going to get the original function. And then we would use the time they gave us and the time we're trying to find. And you get x3 minus x0, right? So if you integrate a derivative, they, the integral and does a derivative, you get the original function, you plug limits in. And this is what we want. And this is what we already have. And so then you would, you know, can, you know, we would write x3 equals x0 plus the integral of 0 to 3 v sub x d, uh, t dt. And then you can use your calculator to do this really nicely for you. Or you could use this to set it up and then do this by hand. You could say, okay, well, uh, the antiderivative of t squared is uh, t cubed over 3 plug limits in <laughs> so I'm gonna let you guys you guys can do the y right um, so you I mean you could either say y sub t equals the integral of v sub y t dt which is the integral of sine pi t dt which is going to be negative cosine pi t 1 over pi plus c and then you could use your initial condition that the y value is 0 when cosine is 0 and cosine 0 is 1 so c equals positive 1 over pi so y t equals negative 1 over pi cosine pi t plus 1 over pi and then you could plug in time three into this and you say okay negative one over pi cosine of three pi plus one over pi cosine of three pi is negative one so you get y three equals two over pi now you're going to want to write your answer as an ordered pair is the right answer okay so but we do this a lot on, on free response problems, especially in fundamental theorem of calculus. This approach is really handy because you have a calculator usually, and it also involves things that you just can't integrate by hand anyways, even if you want to, and besides the fact that you don't have time. Okay, number four, the velocity vector, velocity vector of a particle moving the xy plane is. So they're giving you that. This is v sub x. This is v sub y. Time greater than zero. At time zero, the particle is at. So this is x zero, y zero. What is the position vector at time equals two? You can use a graphic calculator. Um, so let's let's go ahead and take that into account that we're going to use a graphic calculator plus look at all the answers. They're all decimals, so you're going to want to use a graphic calculator. So let's use fundamental theorem of calculus part one, where we say, all right, we're going to have to find each position separately. So we're going to have to say, okay, well, um, so by the way, this is x zero, y zero. It might be helpful to write those next to them. So the initial condition has two different separate initial conditions. So if you want to find x, so we got to find x2 and y2, right? That's our goal. And then write them as an ordered pair. So if you want to find x2, you say, well, let's integrate x prime t dt from the time we know to the time we want or whichever one's smaller to whichever one's bigger, and then we get x2 minus x0. Fundamental theorem mechanics part one. We use this all the time on all kinds of different problems. So from here, this is what you want. So you can rewrite it x2 equals and um, x0 plus 0 to 2 vt dt. And then you can say, all right, well, x2 equals x0 is 1 and velocity in the x direction is two sine t dt. And then I'm just gonna do that all on my calculator. I mean, I know it's not that hard to do by hand, but it is gonna be faster on a calculator and potentially help you avoid some mistakes. So we're gonna do um, 
one plus math nine two sine x comma x comma zero comma two all right and hit enter and there's your answer 3.8323 three decimal I actually round truncated okay uh, there's only one on here so if we were in a hurry we'd be like mm, uh, that's it now I'd be careful because maybe you made a common mistake that and they tricked you so you should probably go ahead and just um, unless you're like running out of time you say well is it or two of y prime t dt is going to equal y2 minus y0 so then y2 equals y0 plus the integral of 0 to t of v sub y t dt and y2 equals y0 was 1 0 to 2 of 3 cosine t dt and then we'll plug this into our calculator so we you guys should be able to crank out fundamental theorem of calculus part one so we're going to do one plus math nine three cosine x close comma x comma zero comma two and i get 3.727 or 3.728 and uh, that looks good. Okay, on to the next page. And so we're still talking about parametrics, but I'm going to talk about a couple other ideas that we didn't mention on the front yet. So we're going to add some notes here. And so what's the slope of a parametric curve? So even though um, yeah, so even though we have time, if you graph a parametric curve, you can graph it on x, y axis because there's x and y. You don't see the time. So the slope, though, of the curve is the slope that it's always been. It's, it's rise of run. It's change in y over change in x. It's dy dx. Now, the way you find it here is we have two separate equations for y and x. So we have to do dy dt over dx dt. And it should make sense that dx dt should be on the bottom, dy dt is on top. And it's that simple. I don't feel like that's a, a thing to memorize. Um, I mean, it, it's something to kind of vaguely know, but um, you should know, you know, and it's kind of like the DTs will cancel each other out algebraically if you thought of it. Equations of a tangent line to the curve. Um, same deal as always. You need a point, an XY pair, which you'd have to find each of these separately right at some time value, right? And then you would also need the slope, which is dy dx. And in this case, that's going to be dy dt over dx dt. So, all right. Why don't you guys, using this new information and some of our practice on the front, why don't you guys try 5, 6, and 8? Okay. Pause the video. Try 5, 6, and 8. After you've tried 5, 6, and 8, unpause the video <clears throat> and I will show you how I got it and check your answer or fix your problem, fix your work, find your mistakes. Do the problem if you're totally stuck on it. So go ahead and try it. <clears throat> So you have X and Y equations and you want to find the dy dt at time two. So remember dy or dy dx. dy dx is dy dt over dx dt. So a lot of times what I might do is find dy dt separately. This is to the one half, one half, two t plus five to the negative one half, power rule, chain rule. Don't forget the chain rule. Right, so, um, and then we could plug, uh, you know, two into this, and the one halves cancel, and this is going to be one over the square root of nine, which is one third. So that's half of what you need. dx dt is going to equal uh, one minus two t, right? And so then x prime or dx dt prime at time two equals one minus two times two is negative three. Now make sure you do these in the correct, I think it's tempting to put the 
you know, you might do DXDT first and then DYDT second. That's cool. But then you're tempted to probably put DXDT on top and DYDT on the bottom when it needs to be the other way. So DYDX equals DYDT over DXDT equals one third over negative three, which is like negative three over one. So it's like one third times negative one third equals negative one ninth. And they have lots of answers there based off common mistakes. Okay, number six, a curve in the plane is defined parametrically by the equations x and y. The equation of line tangent to the curve is what? So we need a point. So we need to plug time one into the x equation to find the x coordinate. So you're going to have to find the x and y coordinate separate. And you got to find the y coordinate. So now you have your x, y coordinate. Now you need uh, dy, dx. dy, dx equals dy, dt over dx, dt. You could also, you know, just do all these derivatives inside the work right here. 2t plus 2 over 2. And then we want dy, dx at time equals 1. So it's going to be 2 times 1 plus 2 over 2 equals 4 over 2 equals 2. That's your slope, y minus 3 equals 2 times x minus 5. On a free response, this would be totally fine. But multiple choice, you're at the mercy. Most of these look like they're slope intercept form. So we'll go ahead, y minus 3 equals 2x minus 6. Add 3, add 3. y equals 2x minus 3. Oh, shoot. Why did I mess up? <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is supposed to be a five. Ah, that's a five, so this is a 10. So this is a negative seven. One of the benefits of multiple choice is if you make a totally weird mistake that they're not counting on, then they'll catch it. <clears throat> All right, I'm skipping seven. You, you're going to do seven later. Uh, number eight, the graph, the graph in the XY plane represented by X... So again, position is part of what kind of shape. So I don't know if you guys remember these. We did some of these. A lot of parametric um, functions can will, will kind of create uh, conic sections, hyperbolas, parabolas, ellipses, halves of circles, straight lines. And the idea was to use the Pythagorean trig identity that said cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. So then you're like, okay, um, well, actually, no, not yet. What we want to do is we want to try and get an, uh, an, an equation with just X's and Y's. So we want to somehow get rid of the T's, which means we usually want to do maybe some kind of form of substitution. Maybe that, maybe trig identities also. Um, but what this one's kind of tricky. I apologize. This is a double angle. You got to use the double angle identity. So uh, cosine of 2t equals uh, cosine squared t minus sine squared t. And that comes from the angle addition identity for cosine. That says it's going to be cosine a, cosine b, minus sine a, sine b. And if they just turn out to be the same thing, then, then you get the same thing and you get squared. So um, that equation now is y equals one minus cosine squared t plus sine squared t, because you have to distribute the negative. And you have this x equals cosine t. And let's see what else we could do. It'd be not, what we could do is we could say x squared equals cosine squared and then replace the cosine squared with that, but then we, we still have a sine squared. Well, that's where another identity can come in, the Pythagorean identity. If uh, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, then sine squared would equal one minus cosine squared. So why we could write even better be one minus cosine squared T 
plus one minus cosine squared t, y equals two minus two cosine squared t. And so then we could say, okay, well, let's replace cosine squared with an x squared. And then you should recognize now that we've gotten it into its Cartesian equation, what kind of shape is that? Well, that's a parabola, right? Upside down parabola. Anyways, uh, we did some of those. I don't think you're going to see anything like that on the AP test, but why not try a couple? Um, okay, I'm going to go to the next page, take some more notes together. So... <clears throat> Vertical tangents, so a lot of times you might say, when is the object moving vertically? And so vertical tangent lines, when we're straight up and down, uh, that's when dy dx is undefined, right? Just in general. And so that means that dy dt over dx dt has to be undefined. Now undefined in this vertical sense comes when the denominator is zero, you're dividing by zero. So the way you identify uh, when it's vertical is when dx dt equals zero, but you gotta be careful, but you know, watch out for dy dt equaling zero at the same time. If it equals zero, that's fine. It could be vertical, but you're getting an indeterminate form. And so it's not clear yet. You'd have to do L'Hopital's rule. Horizontal tangents. <laughs> Are flat. It's when the slope of a graph is zero. And since the slope equals dy dt over dx dt, the way we would find these is by setting the numerator equal to zero. But be careful that the denominator isn't zero at the same time. Now, if it is, that's not a prop, that's not bad. Doesn't mean it's horizontal. It can't be horizontal and vertical at the same time, is the issue. Because in both of these, you get 0, 0, 0, 0. Well, which one is it, vertical or horizontal? It's one or the other or something else. It could be like at an angle. So you just have to use L'Hopital's rule. Otherwise, it's indeterminate and have to use L'Hopital's Ooh. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I think there was a name for those kind of points. So uh, a lot of times what happens is it, it's something like this, that you're right at the corner of like a cusp in the motion when something like that happens. And it might be at an angle, um, but at that instant, it's not moving left or right or up or down. But that doesn't mean it's vertical, tangent, or horizontal. It could be at a slant. It could be vertical. It could be horizontal. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of that uh, name for that kind of point. But second derivatives, uh, this is the nastiest, one of the nastiest formulas from this year. It's second derivative, the concavity of a parametric curve is not, it's not the acceleration. The acceleration, we find the acceleration of x separate and y separate. So this isn't like an overall acceleration, but it's this is generally the second derivative, right? And usually the way we find the second derivative is by taking the derivative of the first derivative, okay? And uh, what that's going to involve is, is we're gonna take, now remember all these things are in terms of t. So if you wanna take the derivative with respect to x, you have to take the derivative with respect to t first, it's a chain rule issue. You got to take the derivative with respect to t first, and then you got to take the derivative of t with respect to x to finish the chain rule. <clears throat> what we do is we put that underneath though, right? Divide by the reciprocal, move it underneath. And that's where this formula comes from. I guess you could just try and memorize it. I mean, you could kind of go through the thought process I just did is second derivative is derivative of the first derivative but the first derivative is in terms of time. So we gotta take the derivative with respect to its variables first, and then take the derivative of time with respect to x, right? It's a, it's a whole chain rule thing, but this is kind of a, 
weird formula. I feel like I'm getting better at explaining it just now. Um, but you know, thing is, it might only come up like once or twice on your whole AP test, just, you know, on multiple choice for your spot. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of, and, and that's one of the reasons it's hard to use too, is that we just don't use it that often. Okay. What I want you guys to try and do now is I want you guys to try problem nine and 10 and uh, try nine and 10. So I want you to pause the video right now, try nine and 10 and then unpause the video. And we'll talk about how to do those problems. So go for it. Okay, the curve is parametrically x and y coordinates, uh, zero to two pi. What are all the points where the curve has a vertical tangent? So we want to figure out where does dy dx equal undefined, which is when dy dt over dx dt equals undefined, which is when dx dt equals zero. So dx dt is uh, negative four cosine t. We can solve this, uh, isolate the trig. Um, <clears throat> t is zero at pi over two plus pi k. So t equals pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, negative pi over two and on and on and on infinite answers. We just want the answers from zero to two pi. So we just want these two answers. Now the thing to check is to check the dy dt. So dy dt equals uh, negative three sine t. <coughs> and if we plug pi over two in here, uh, we don't want to get zero. If we get zero, that's not necessarily bad. It just means more work. But that equals negative three, so that's good. And then the other one is at three pi over two. I think this is going to be fine, right? Three pi over two is at is negative one, so you're going to get positive three. So that's fine. We just want to make sure they don't equal zero. If they do, we just have to do more. We have to invest more work. Okay, number 10, we're trying to find the second derivative, not, or, uh, so the second derivative of y with respect to x, not the acceleration, but it's the concavity of the parametric curve. And so uh, let's see if we can remember it without just looking up here. So we could cover that answer up and say, okay, well, the second derivative of y with respect to x is going to be the derivative of dy dx. And this is how you write it. This, this is the change in the derivative with respect to x. But to take the derivative of dy dx, we have to take the derivative of it with respect to time first. That's the variable it has in it. And then we have to multiply by the derivative of x of, of time with respect to x. And so it's going to end up dx dt on the bottom. Um, so let's see, we need dx dt. And so dx dt equals cosine t. Uh, we need dy dt. dy dt equals, um, now this is cosine squared. So that's going to be two cosine t to the first power times derivative of it inside negative sine t. That's a whole chain rule thing. Be careful. And then, then we want to get dy dx, which is dy dt over dx dt, which we've been using a lot. And so that's going to be negative two sine t cosine t over cosine t. Those are going to cancel, so that's good. So then we got to take. So I think we're finally getting we're finally getting there. So the second derivative is the derivative with respect to time of dy dx, which we just found over dx dt. So the derivative of dy dx is negative two cosine t. The derivative of dx uh, 
dx dt was cosine t up there. And so the second derivative, no matter what, <coughs> is simply always negative 2, which means it's concave down all the time. And the answer is negative 2 no matter what time we plug in. That's what it is. Okay, I'm going to let you guys try 11 and 12 on your own later. But for now, I'm going to move on to the next page. We'll take some more notes. <clears throat> try some more problems together. Um, okay, so this is polar. So we're going to do a quick review of polar. Um, if you have a point in a xy plane, we can identify its location with an x and a y coordinate. And that's what you guys are used to. But we could also describe that location with an angle and the distance from the origin, which we call the radius. And that's what polar is, which is just a different way of, of the, describing certain functions that we already use all the time. But also it's really helpful for some new functions that I don't think we could write in a rectangular Cartesian form. Some of the basic relationships are Pythagorean theorem. And there's a mistake here. This should be an R squared r squared equals x squared plus y squared. If you want to find, if you have the radius and theta and you want to find the x that goes with it, you use basic trig. So this is where the, the angle is always right here next to the origin. So this is always the adjacent side. This is always the opposite side. And this is always the hypotenuse. And so what we do is we say, okay, well, if you want to find x, well, then you want to use theta and r, which would be the hypotenuse and adjacent. Well, that has to be cosine theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse. And then you get this relationship, x equals r cosine theta. And then if you want to find y, that's opposite over hypotenuse. That's sine theta equals y over r. And then you get this relationship. And then we could find theta backwards from x and y because tangent of theta equals opposite over adjacent. And so then you could solve for theta. We don't use that one a lot. We use these two a ton, like, like every polar problem, it seems like. Okay. The area within a polar curve. Um, so I'll show you the derivation real quick. And then you're going to memorize. You probably just want to memorize it. But you have a curve and you want to find the area. And what happens is it, it slices it in a radial so if we want to find this area, it's slicing it like that. And so this is our function, uh, our radius in terms of theta function. That's usually how they're written. And so what we do is we, we kind of approximate the area of that sliver as if it were like the piece of a piece of pie. Uh, which is called a sector in a circle. It is not perfectly a sector, but it's pretty close. And it's kind of like fitting rectangles or trapezoids to a curve. Um, it does a pretty good job. Now, going back to geometry, we learned this basic idea that the fraction of this sector to the whole circle is always the same for area, arc length, and angle. So the area of a sector over the area of the whole circle which is pi r squared equals the arc length of the sector over the arc length of the whole circle, which is circumference equals the angle that creates the sector over the angle of a whole circle, which is two pi radians. And so from this, we can get that the area of a sector is, I'm not going to use this equals uh, theta over 2 pi times the area of the whole circle pi r squared. And from that, the pi's cancel and you get 1 half r squared theta. Now in our problem over here, the angle is going to be d theta. It's going to be an infinite, infinitesimally small sliver of an angle. So this is a very skinny sector looking thing. And so the area of one slice is one half r squared d theta. And then if you want all of them, you integrate them. And so usually you put the one half in front. So usually it's going to be one half uh, and you know, the angles might be alpha to beta 
uh, r squared d theta. But this, you're going to memorize, I'm probably memorize this. The derivation wasn't crazy, but you don't want to go through that every time. So let's memorize that. Now, arc length, I mentioned it up here, but we're not going to use that. We're going to use this other idea. I'm not going to derive it right now. We, we derived it. It comes kind of from this idea that you have an arc and you have a, we're going to estimate it with like a secant line, like a small sliver. And what we could do is we could say, well, there's like a, there's a change in X and there's a change in Y and the length of the sliver is the square root of Delta Y squared plus Delta X squared. And then we bring in the derivatives and we do a bunch of manip manipulation and eventually we get this formula alpha to beta square root of r squared plus dr d theta squared which makes me which which i feel like is very similar to the arc length or length of parametric which involves dx dt squared plus dy dt squared and square root so it has a square root it has two things squared it has a derivative squared dr d theta and then it just has a regular radius squared um the pole is another word another name for the origin and what is always true at the pole is that the radius is zero so sometimes you're asked to find things that are true about the pole or or the pole is important has interesting uh you know conclusions and so the way you identify it is by setting r equals zero and then you can solve for what angle it goes through the pole you need to find the intersection of curves a lot of times. The way you find an intersection is the curves instead of setting the y's equal to each other when you have Cartesian, we're going to set the radius equal to each other and then solve for theta. Okay, so similar, a similar approach. Um, there are some common shapes that come up um, that I think are good to just be familiar with because then you have a quick rough idea of what the shape looks like. Not that you're going to be asked about the names, but circles um, have the equation. Um, this is I'm kind of trying to squeeze a lot of information here. Circles have the equation r equals a sine theta or r equals a cosine theta. Now, all these shapes will have sine and cosine, sine or cosine in them. And whenever it's sine, it's going to be vertical in nature. And whenever it has cosine, it's going to be horizontal in nature. And that's true for all of these. And that, that's another helpful thing to know just up front. So those are circles. Uh, Limasson. Uh, Limasson, let's see, is this whole family of other shapes that include cardioids and flattened Limassons and Limassons with inner loops. And so Limassons in general are B plus A sine theta or R equals B plus A cosine theta. And A could be negative. A is a number. It could be positive and negative. So the difference between these is that there's this extra term being added to the radius. And there's a couple special cases. If A equals B, then you get what's called a cardioid, which kind of looks like a heart, more like a peach but kind of heart ish um if it has if uh if a is greater than b then you get um a limason so here's a, a limason looks like this a limason with an inner loop looks like this a flattened limason looks like like this, and then there's even like a dimpled limason. The flattened limason is when B is bigger than A. Now, uh, and then there's also uh, rose curves, flower petals, and they are R equals, they're like circles, R equals A sine, and then there's some something multiplying the angle inside. Now, circles are a one-petaled flower, essentially, one-petaled rose curve. Now, to, uh, to find the area, we often square the radius, and it often has all these sines and cosines, so we get these complicated expressions that we often can't integrate because there's going to be cosine squareds and sine squareds. 
on their own, we can't integrate them. So we have to make use of the double angle identity for cosine. Okay. And uh, it might be good to just memorize this because we derived it, but it took a bunch of other identities. But cosine squared equals one half plus one half cosine double angle two theta. Sine squared is using the same double angle identity. It's one half, one half. It's cosine two theta, but it's minus. That's the main difference. Cosine, cosine squared is the plus. Sine squared is the minus. So we use those a ton. Okay, so that's a lot of information crammed up there about polar. Um, so why don't you guys try 13, 14, and 15. Um, and pause the video. And then uh, after you try 13, 14, 15, uh, we'll come back and I'll try them. And then you can uh, check your answers and fix them. Okay. All right, if function, uh, so this is your R function, it's continuous, uh, A non-negative, uh, you have alpha and beta, R, the angle is between alpha and beta, which are between zero and two pi, which just means kind of like a full circle. Zero to two pi is what's re required to get a whole shape. So the period of most of these polar curves is zero to two pi, um, with a couple exceptions. The area enclosed in the polar curve for r equals f theta from alpha to beta is what? And so this is very general, but you could, you know, you could draw a curve and you say, okay, well, it's going to be, you know, theta equals alpha to some theta equals beta, and it goes this direction. And so we're trying to find that area. And so <clears throat> the area formula that you should have memorized is one half the integral of r squared d theta. And so we're going to integrate from alpha to beta, the smaller angle to the bigger angle. Otherwise, you're going to get a negative area, which isn't, you know, we're looking for area. Area can't be negative. And then the radius was f theta, and then you would square it. So that's the right answer. And on here, there's a bunch of answers that are slightly wrong. The square should be on the outside. Uh, here, this one's missing the squared. Uh, here, this one has this extra theta, and the squared should be on the outside. Uh, here, this one has this extra theta, and's missing the squared. E is good. Okay? All right. 14, which of the following gives the area of the region enclosed by the graph of the polar curve r equals 1 plus cosine theta? Now, the thing you got to realize is like tons of these don't have the one half, so you're like, oh, that must be the right one. If that's the only one that even looks like the right answer, I'd be scared to pick it. There's this thing where most of these um, polar shapes have symmetry, and so often we'll integrate half of them and double it. And they often have answers that are based off that idea. So it's good to know the shape of the graph and to maybe do a quick sketch of it to see where the symmetry lies, because I bet all of these are trying to make use of that. So this is a uh, this is a lemison, and when that coefficient, that coefficient equal, that's a cardioid. And because it has cosine, it's going to be horizontal. Not that you have to memorize the horizontal thing. I often would make tables real quick. I think it's worth the 30 extra seconds. 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. I just start with some really nice easy angles, and we're going to plug them into the R function. So when uh, cosine 0, you get 1 plus 1 is 1. Cosine pi over 2 is 0. So 1 plus 1 is 2. Cosine pi over 2 is 0, you get 1. Cosine pi is negative 1, you get 0. Cosine 3 pi over 2 is 0, you get 1. Cosine 2 pi is 1, you get 2. And so then I'm going to make a graph right here. And this is also something you guys want to get good at again. It's an xy graph, okay? And so angle 0 is to the right, and the radius is 2. And then um, at pi over 2, we're looking straight up with a radius of 1. At pi, we're looking to the left with the radius of 0. At 3 pi over 2, we're pointing down with the radius of 1. And 2 pi are back here. Now, if you get a negative radius, that means you got to flip it backwards from the direction that the angle points. But this is... 
This is a quick rough sketch of this cardioid and we're trying to find the area in the whole thing. Now what we're probably going to do is find this area and double it. Okay. And that's how it finds the area. It's slicing it, slicing it. So we're going to go from zero to pi and double it. So we would say, okay, well, one half zero to pi of r squared one plus cosine theta squared d theta. That's going to give you the area of half of it, but then we're going to double it to get the whole area and the one half goes away. So we're looking for one half, we're looking for that one right there. This one has a squared in the wrong spot. This one doesn't have the squared and doesn't have the one half because it goes zero to two pi. This one doesn't have the one half. 0 2 pi. This one has the 1 half 0 to 2 pi, but the squared is in the wrong spot. So the answer is B. Okay, 15. Which of the following uh, integrals gives the total area of the region inside both polar curves? So this is where it starts to get tricky, and this is where a graph really helps. These are both circles, but you're going to need to figure out where they overlap each other. That's where, that's the area. Now this one's a horizontal and this one's vertical and we can make you know some quick little tables right here zero pi over two pi three pi over two now here's the thing about these circles is they actually um, only need zero to pi to go through their whole shape so you don't really need this if you remember that cosine of zero is one so we get two uh, cosine pi over two is zero so you get zero and then you two. And then the other one is gonna be r equals sine uh, two sine theta. So that's gonna be zero, that's gonna be two, that's gonna be zero. So I'm gonna graph these together. I know I get radiuses as big of as big as two. So the first one is zero two, angle zero, and then pi over two zero. And so this is this is the shape. This is that sideways circle. Okay, and then the next one sign should be kind of vertically oriented. So zero zero is here, pi over two, two is there. So this is gonna be that circle. And we're looking for the region that's inside both of them, which is this. Now what we have to do is we have to find the intersection and cut it there because the way the area works is it slices it like this and so we're going to have to find it. We're going to have to integrate one circle to get this area. That's the vertical circle and then integrate the other one to get this one. So we got to figure out what this angle is because that's going to be one of our limits. So what we do is we set the R's equal to each other and you could then, you know, however you want to do it, you could say you could you could divide by two, you could divide by cosine and say, all right, well, when does tangent equal one? But then I would think when is sine over cosine equal one? When is sine and cosine the same? Um, and that would be at pi over two quadrant one and quadrant three will give you a positive. This is clearly quadrant one from our picture. So this is pi over two. So then what we can do is we could say, all right, well, let's integrate this curve. That's going to be zero to pi over two of the vertical curve, the, the sine one, two sine theta squared d theta with a one half in front. Plus, then we're going to start at pi over two and go, or pi over four, by the way, pi over four, pi over four. I realized my mistake because it's going to go from pi over 4 to pi over 2 to get this other curve, this one right here. So it matters which one you do. The cosine is the horizontal one. So this is the way you could do it, but none of the answers have this. They all have 0 to pi over 4 or just 0 to pi over 2. So what you need to realize, again, symmetry, is that this half right here is the same as that half. So we could also just double this or just double this and get the answer. And I bet it's one of those. Zero to pi over four, sine squared. Uh, the two has to get squared also. So this one's wrong because it needs a four. 
Um, I don't think it's this one. Uh, I don't think it's that. Okay, let's see. Here it is. The one half and the two canceled. You have zero to pi over four sine squared, but the two gets squared. So it's gotta be E. All right, quick crash course on some parametrics. Um, next page is arc length of parametrics. And um, I think I showed you guys the idea, um, but I'm not gonna go through the derivation. You can look back in the notes, but it's uh, alpha. Um, actually, you know what? This is arc length of a Cartesian graph. So I already talked about arc length of polar. So arc length of an XY graph. And so what it ends up giving you is one plus dy dx squared dx. Or you could do it in terms of y and it'd be one plus <coughs> dy dx, uh, I'm sorry, dx dy square dy. I don't think you're going to do that, but so it's probably this one. Now this one looks a lot like those other graphs um, or those other equations for slope. Um, the other ones, so for parametrics, it, the uh, arc length or total distance was square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt for that's parametrics for polar. It was uh, alpha to beta of the square root of r squared plus dr d theta squared with respect to theta. So these are the all three of the different length formulas, and they're all very similar to each other. And I use that to help me. But then you got to remember the differences. They all have square roots. They all have things squared. They all have derivative squared. Uh, this one has both derivatives because there's two different derivatives. This one has just that dr d theta squared and then r squared. This one has dy dx squared and a one. Um, okay, you guys could try 17, 18, and 19. Uh, pause the video and then I will try the problem. Um, so go ahead and try 17, 18, and 19. You want the length of the curve. This is a graph and Kaggle problem. This is a cubic. We're going from zero, zero to one, one. I mean, sometimes it's just nice to have a picture here. And so we're trying to find the length of that curve. So we need, we're using this formula. So we need dy dx, which is three x squared. And then the length is gonna equal the integral from zero to one of the square root of one plus three x squared squared dx. Uh, so this is gonna be zero to one of the square root of one plus nine x to the fourth, which you have no hope of solving by hand, but on a graphing calculator, we could do math nine square root one plus nine x to the fourth uh, close the square root, comma x, comma zero, comma one. And we get 1.547 or 1.548. They're not going to give you the rounded and truncated answers. Uh, 18, which of the following different integrals gives the length of the graph y equals e to the e to the x from zero to one. Well, we need dy dx which is going to be the derivative of e is the derivative of itself, but then you got to do the derivative of what's inside, chain rule, e the x. Maybe we want to rewrite this using rules of exponents. It'd be e to the e to the x plus x. And so the length is going to be the integral from zero to one of the square root of one plus e to the e to the x plus x squared dx. Rules of exponents will let you write that as uh, e to the 2e to the x plus 2. I don't know if that's one of these answers. So e or or that one right there. I think it's a. So the answer is a. This one doesn't have the squared. This one doesn't. That one's just missing other stuff. So there you go. That's 18. 19 is if the length of the curve y equals fx from x to a. 
uh, then f of x may be what? Um, so we're looking for the derivative of something in here. This is supposed to be 1 plus dy dx squared, right? So that would mean that dy dx would have to be, take 1 away from that, e to the 2x plus 2e to the x plus 1. And so then we say, okay, well, then what would the original function have been? Um, it would have been e to the 2x with a 1 half in front because the chain rule uh, plus 2e to the x plus x plus c. So 1 half e to the 2x plus 2 to the x plus, plus 2x. No, I don't think it's 2x. Um, I don't know. I mean, that one. Um, let me think think here what are we doing what's going on what's what's wrong um, um, f prime of x now I'm, I'm stuck oh shoot this was actually this squared right uh, so what we have to do is we have to figure out, oh, is that something squared? That's, I think that's you know, e to the x plus 1 times e to the x plus 1 would give you e to the 2x plus 2e to the x plus 1. So this is <clears throat> e to the x plus 1 squared. That's the derivative of y with respect to x squared. So dy dx equals <clears throat> just e to the x plus 1. So y equals e to the x plus x plus c. e to the x plus x plus c. Now c could be any number, right? Okay. On to the next page, last page, Euler's method, which I think it's been just a little while since we talked about that. So we'll do some quick notes here now. Euler's method is really just a repeated... Uh, Tangent line approximation. Now I'm going to need to stop the video because I'm around a room, so I'm going to do the separate video on a separate one. So tune back in. <clears throat>